Turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter number 15. Luke, chapter number 15. I, I like to fool around too much. I've got to get straightened out here. I got my Ricola last night. I took a coffin spell. Uh, you heard about the hearse that was going up the hill, and all of a sudden the back door popped open, and the casket went flying down the hill. It went into a drugstore, hit the counter. Uh, the lid popped open, and the man sat up. He said, got anything to stop his coffin? So... Uh, <laughs> I got it. I got my Ricola. <laughs> I appreciate the wonderful singing. You are blessed to have the wonderful music that you have at your church. Christ honoring music. It just feeds your heart and soul. And wow, the words, are, they just really touch my heart. Thank you so much for the wonderful music. Luke chapter number 15, we have um, three parables that are mentioned in this chapter. And um, sometimes we like to die, you know, take them apart, and, but, uh, and I am only going to preach one of them. But these three parables make up a whole, and um, there's um, a purpose behind all three of the parables. And, and the end of the chapter ties all of the parables together in the story of the elder brother uh, who is sitting there and he's, he's steaming over the fact that his younger brother has gone off and wasted everything and has come back and his father has received him after this younger brother's wasted all of it. He, he just can't understand what has happened. And, and so the father comes out to the elder brother and says, come in, why don't you come in? And then he begins to complain to his father about him receiving the younger brother. And um, I love the story of these, of these three parables that we have in this chapter. Begin reading in verse number one. If you're able to stand, if you're not, please, I understand. And, but if you're able to stand, we'll begin reading in verse number one. And my wife has had just recently knee replacement, and I've really taken into consideration there are people that cannot stand when I say, would you, would you stand? Because there for a while she was having difficulty just getting up out of a chair. So I understand if you can't. Verse number one, it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you to, uh, today again for the privilege we have to be here and for the wonderful time that we've had to hear the uplifting uh, songs, the music, by the choir and the congregation, and thank you for the, just for the fellowship that we have at Ben Salem Baptist Church uh, from last year to this year. It just seems like this is a church that just steadily grows closer to you, and, and it's evident with the hand of God upon this congregation. And now, Father, as we look into the Word of God, we pray for your blessing. If there's one in our midst that does not know Christ, I pray that you would touch that, that heart today. And if there's someone today struggling with... Um, with this thing of serving God, I pray that you'd help them to understand that they have a place in the harvest of God and they can be found faithful when Jesus comes doing what you've called them to do. So please have your way in all of our hearts. Speak to us as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. I love verse number one. Did you know that uh, there's some truths that you find which were spoken by the Pharisees and uh, people that... Um, Actually, we're actually complaining and murmuring, but we find great truths. Look at verse number one. It says, Then drew near unto him all the Pharisees and uh, publicans and sinners for to hear him. And so here comes this great, uh, great group of people. And for the most part, the people that were coming, you know, were usually the religious crowd. You know, they were there to, to pick apart what the Lord might say to find fault in his teachings. But along with that religious crowd, here comes the, the, the publicans. They were the tax collectors and 
And I know we're close to Philadelphia, and uh, I know you have an IRS center in Philadelphia because I send a lot of taxes this way. But <clears throat> anyway, I don't want to you know, say anything against our good IRS folks, but they were the IRS, the Israeli Revenue Service. I mean, no, anyway, uh, they actually were, it was the RRS, you know, the Roman Revenue Service, but uh, they were despised, they were hated because they didn't just collect for the Roman government, they also collected a little bit for themselves, actually a lot for themselves, and so they were despised, they were considered traitors to the Jewish people and they were coming to hear the Lord speak. And along with them, they were what were called sinners. Now we know the Bible says that we've all sinned and come short of the, of the glory of God. We're all sinners in that, in that aspect. But when the Bible talks about these people as sinners, they were the bottom. They were the lowest of the low, the women as far as they could go, the men as, as far as they could go. And they were just the off scouring. You couldn't get any worse than those people. But here they come. And so in verse number two, when the Pharisees and scribes saw this multitude of people coming that really had no right to be there, who were they? You know, what right did they have uh, to intrude, uh, you know, in this religious setting? They murmured and said this, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Can I tell you, though they were making an accusation against the Lord, aren't you glad for the truth of that statement? that he absolutely does receive sinners and he absolutely does eat with them. And because the Lord Jesus then proceeds to give these three parables. He gives the parable about the lost sheep and, uh, and the lost silver and, and the lost son and shares with them the truth that he, they have just spoken in, in the way of an accusation and the way of a complaint. Now, in these three parables, number one, the Lord Jesus is going to make pertinent the situation where they are, where you go through this chapter and you find seven times he uses the word lost. Now, I've lost some things in my life. I've lost a lot of things in my life. You know, this is not the word where you misplace or you make a wrong turn. This, this word literally means to be totally marred or ruined. It's not that you're in your car and you drive and you take a wrong turn. You go off the cliff. That's what this word is all about. And so he's telling them, this is pertinent to you because humanity is lost in sin and humanity needs help. And this is what this verse of scripture is talking about. Now, not only did he make it pertinent, he also made it practical to them. Now, did you know there's over, well, I guess now today there's probably 7.3 billion people. Now, I had, your son is gone, right? He's not here. What's his name? The one that was talking to me this morning? Daniel, oh my goodness, this boy got it today. Uh, he's the smartest one of the whole family. And uh, he really is. I, I looked at Daniel between, after Sunday school, between Sunday school and preaching hour, and I said, I said, boy, I wish I had some of your hair. And he said, but you're good looking. I mean, he's, he, he got it. Finally, it's taken me now two years to get this across to your church, you know. <laughs> By the time this is over, brother, I hope they have gotten it. Okay, I'm not smart, I'm good looking. But 7.3 billion people, I don't get that. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of people. Uh, the, the largest country in the world, the country of China, one point, almost 1.4 billion people today. I, I, I've been to China, and I don't get that. That's a lot of people. Um, India, one point, almost 1.3 billion people. The third largest country in the world where you're part of it today, and that's the United States of America, about, a, about 330 million people. Uh, get around, you know, from here to Atlanta, Georgia, I think uh, uh, probably 300 million <laughs> me and them were on the road coming up here uh, when we left home uh, Friday. I don't get that. Um, in, uh, uh, rather, Indonesia, the, the, the fourth largest country in the world, the largest Muslim country, about 250 million people. But he makes these parables practical because he's not talking to, about billions and millions and thousands and hundreds. He's talking about one. It was one lost sheep that went astray. It was one lost piece of silver. It was one lost son. He makes it work down where we can understand because, you know, when, I, when he talks about me trying to reach the world of billions of people, I can't get that. But it, when he talks about reaching just one, I can get that. One neighbor next door, one person across the street, one person I work with, one person in my family, I can understand one, you know, I don't know about you, I can understand that. So he makes it practical, but then he brings it on down and he makes it personal. And in this chapter, he talks about what man of you, what man of you 
either what woman? Um, he says, there was a certain man which had two sons. He brings it down to make it personal. Because can I tell you that those people that are out there that we talk about being lost, they are somebody's dad and they are somebody's mom and somebody's son and somebody's daughter. Uh, they are somebody that belong to somebody. And understanding that we know somebody today, and he makes it personal to these, to these Pharisees and scribes who were murmuring because these publicans and sinners were coming just to hear some word of hope and some word of help. They were murmuring and complaining. But when I look at these three parables, there's something besides the number one through, all out, uh, through these. And, but there was also something that there was very special about all three of these parables. You know what it was? They all three had someone that cared for them. Whether it was a shepherd for his sheep or the woman for her silver or their father for his son, they all had somebody that cared. And I know we have a loving Heavenly Father hmm, that cares about everyone that's lost. But you know what he wants today for us to understand? Like he wanted these Pharisees and these um, scribes to understand that we need to care. Instead of murmuring and complaining, it's mission conference time and they're wanting me to give and, and they're wanting me... Hey, somebody cared enough to do something about that which was lost. So this morning, I'd like to share with you uh, this thought, three, three simple points about the lost sheep and we'll be done. Now, I want you to notice in verse number three and four, he says, and he spake this parable unto them saying, what man of you... Having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness. Let me stop right there. Had this been me, I would have said, you know what, I got ninety-nine more. Good grief, what is one dumb sheep, you know? But I'm, I'm not the shepherd of that sheepfold. I think about, you know, I, I had um, four brothers, uh, three brothers, I, I can't even count. There's four boys, and my mom, mom and dad had four sons. <laughs> I'm one of four. <laughs> And I think about which one of my brothers would I want to give up and say, okay, we still, there's th still three of us. We're all good looking, by the way. You know, I'm the best looking of the bunch. But, you know, which of us would I want to give up? Um, I, had, I, had, uh, I had two children. We had three, actually, had another girl that came to live with us for many years. And, and her name is Jenny. And which one of my kids would I want to give up? I've got 10 grandkids and somebody, I told somebody yesterday that, that grandchildren, that's the, gift, that's the gift God gives you for not killing your own kids, you know. Um, and that's that the truth. Just wait till you have them. Good night. Uh, which one of my grandchildren would I say, you know what, uh, I don't, you know, if that, one, if that one gets killed, if something happens to that one, that's okay. You know, I got nine more. No, mm, couldn't do that. And so um, when I look at that, he has 99 sheep that are safe. But there's one that was lost. And so it's around that that he, this shepherd gets up and look what it says. He leaves the 99 in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. Now, number one, look with me at the work for just one. Now, there's 99 in the, that are safe. And he gets up, leaves those 99 safely there in that fold. And he goes and he begins to look for just one. Now, there's something interesting when you look in this verse of scripture, he goes and he loses the one. If he lose one, listen to Isaiah chapter number 50, 53, verse number six. All we like sheep. Do I need to move this down, brother? Are we good? Do y'all hear the echo? Okay. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of, his, of us all. Now listen to what that verse of scripture said. All we like sheep have gone astray. That verse of scripture puts the blame solely on me and you. We're the ones that's responsible. The sheep was the one that got up one day and walked away. The sheep is responsible for whatever problem the sheep was in, for whatever danger the sheep was in. The sheep was to blame. And this morning, can I tell you, when, when I look at the drug addict or the drunkard, when I look at all the sin of this world, and when I look at you and, I, and you look at me, you know who's to blame for the sin that we are in today? It's me and you. There's no other person that we can blame. I cannot blame it on Adam, even though we know we got our sin nature from Adam who, and, you know, from our parents all the way back to Adam. We're, you know, but I can't blame it on Adam. I can't blame it on society. I can't blame it on my environment. I can't blame it on my upbringing. I know people that have had horrible upbringings. I know people who have gone through terrible things in their life. But you know what happened? They didn't blame it on that. They, they took full responsibility for their own condition. All we like sheep have gone astray. We're the ones to blame. We can't blame anybody else for our lost condition. 
But I want you to notice in verse number 4, I love this, if he lose one. It didn't say anything about the dumb sheep that walked away. It didn't say anything about why the sheep did what it did. You know who is taking responsibility for the lost sheep? The shepherd. Can I tell you today, I'm glad I have a loving Heavenly Father that has taken complete and full responsibility for my redemption. You know what? I'm to blame. God the Father could have looked down and said, you know what? They deserve exactly what they're going to get. And they're going to spend an eternity in hell because they have rebelled against me and my laws. They deserve everything that's coming their way. But I'm glad for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Someone has said that, that God the Father bankrupt heaven when He sent His only begotten Son into the world. He bankrupt the coffers of heaven. He bankrupt all the glory of heaven to send His Son into this world to save just one. And the Lord Jesus came into this world and I am persuaded to believe had you been the only one, had I been the only one, He would have done exactly the same thing to save just one. This word go in our, in our verse of Scripture and go after that which is lost, that word go... It, it means to take a journey, but figuratively in their language, it means to die. It, isn't that amazing? Because when that shepherd went off looking for the sheep, that shepherd did not know how far the shepherd was going to have to go. The shepherd did not know what dangers the shepherd was going to face. The shepherd did not know how long it would take. But the shepherd went to do what the shepherd desired to do, of his own free will to do, to do what was necessary to find the sheep. He went. Until. I love that word. That word until. Uh, you know, it, it, it's one thing for you to start doing something and get discouraged and quit. But it's another thing to accomplish the mission. I'm glad the Lord Jesus didn't come into this world and go through everything that he went through up to the cross. Because if he had gone just to the cross or near the cross, you and I would still be lost in our sin. But he went until he found it. And he labored for just one. Labored for just one until he found it. Verse number five. And when he hath found it, he let it on his shoulders rejoicing. Number two, the weight of just one. W-E-I-G-H-T, the weight. When he finds the sheep, when whatever condition he finds the sheep, he picks the, the sheep up and lays it on his shoulders. I love this. You know, where, where the Lord puts us on his shoulders, um, that is where the weight of sin went. And um, I, I, believe, I believe this. I believe that the Lord Jesus died for the sins of every person, whether they ever get saved or not. I believe that, sal hmm. I believe that salvation was secured for everyone if they want to get saved even if they reject it, even if they say no to the Savior, no to the gospel, and they die and they go to hell, I want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ did everything that was necessary to redeem them, to purchase them, to save them, and all they got to do is come. All they have to do is believe, receive Him. He did everything that was necessary. But can I tell you what I believe? I believe that not only did he do it for the sins of all world uh, of the whole world and for every person that would ever be born, I want you to know he did it for just one. He, take, he took that one sheep and laid it on his shoulders and he bore the sins. Can you see that sheep that's scarred and or, or bleeding and wounded and hungry and thirsty? And it, it, it bears in its own body its own rebellion as it willfully went away. It's bearing all of the marks. And as the shepherd puts that sheep on its shoulders, it's not the shepherd's blood that's trickling down its back, but it's that sheep's blood and the wounds of the sheep that he's laying there. And friend, he did not die for his own sin. He was sinless, spotless, no sin. But there on that cross, he bore my sin, my shame, everything that was against me, he bore it. And I believe he did it just for me. As he bore the sins of the whole world, he bore the sins for just one. And that's why I'm so glad. I was saved on August the 1st, 1971. Now, you don't have to remember the date that you were saved. You know, the only reason I remember is because I wrote it down in my Bible. 
but I love to go back and think about August the 1st, 1971. But here's what I'm glad of. I'm glad that the next Sunday and the next Sunday or the next day and the next day, I didn't have to keep going back to get salvation. I didn't have to keep going back to do it again and do it again. I'm glad that he bore my sins in himself one time on the cross and, and my sins were forgiven in Christ Jesus once and for all for all eternity. And I'm glad that when he picked that sheep up and put, his, put the sheep on his shoulders, he bore my sins once and for all. And that in him I am safe and secure. Hallelujah for what he did for me. So the way of our sin, but then it's the place of strength. The shoulders is a place of strength. Uh, uh, listen to this. Isaiah chapter number, vi- uh, chapter number 9 and verse number 6. The Bible says, for unto us a child is born, speaking of the humanity of Christ being born of the virgin, unto us a child is given, speaking of the God part. It was the God man, God in this world as he came into this world. But then it goes on to say that the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now that verse of scripture is talking about the millennial kingdom when he rules and reigns and he is the administrator of the entire world. But here, you know, there's not, a, there's not a, a word in the Bible that wasn't put there by accident. Even the plurals and the singulars in the Bible are there on purpose. That verse of Scripture says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder singular. That means during the millennial kingdom, that thousand-year reign upon this earth, and then for all eternity even, But for during that millennial kingdom, on his shoulder is going to rest the administration of the entire world. You think about it. The entire world. Man, I can't even rule myself, much less the entire world. Good night. The entire world. But I want you to look what the Bible says in Luke chapter number 15, verse number 5. And when he hath found it, he layeth it upon his, look at this now, shoulders. Now, here's what I believe. Y'all can can call me a heretic or whatever. Here's what I believe. I believe that one sinner is more valuable than all the government administration of all mankind. I believe one sinner, and he lays us on his shoulders, and there is that place. Can you imagine that this, this sheep that has gone astray it's having to run here and run there trying to find safety from all the wild animals and this sheep, this sheep is tired. I was only 18 years old when I got saved, but can I tell you, I was tired. I had been under, I had been under conviction for about a year. And I just didn't want, I didn't want like I said in Sunday school, church was for, a, for people that didn't have a life. Didn't have a life. I mean, you go to church, that's because you don't have anything to do. And I'd say, go, you know, get up and go have a life. But the day that I got saved, wow, just before my 19th birthday, I found out those folks that were at church, I found out, you know what, in Christ, they had a life. I found out in Christ, now it wasn't the church, but they met in church because they wanted to worship the one that gave them life. And listen, he picks that sheep up and put put uh, put the sheep on his shoulders and there is the place of rest. I want you to know I have never rested like I've rested in him. A preacher was saying, he was asking me last night, are you tired? Well, I was tired physically, but you know what? In him I rest. I don't have to go anywhere now to find what I found in him. All the peace I'll ever need I found in him. All the hope I'll ever need I found in him. All the help I'll ever need I found in him. I mean, I don't have to go anywhere. It, he is my rest. But not only that, he's my refuge. You know, I don't know all the animals that that, that sheep encountered in the wilderness. I, I know the sheep was still alive, but can you imagine all the fear that, that got hold of that sheep, the trauma? But when that shepherd put that sheep on his shoulders, you know what was going to happen from that point on? Every danger that was out there was going to have to come to that shepherd, go through that shepherd to get to that sheep. And friend, I want you to know anything that is going to touch me is going to have to go through my Savior first. The Almighty the, om, the omnipotent. It's going to have to go through him. I am secure in him today. And the weight of just one on his shoulders, he bore that sheep. And then, last of all, the wonder, the wonder of just one. 
Again, verse number 5, And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing, rejoicing. The theme of this chapter, I didn't give you that, but the theme of this chapter is this thing of rejoicing. Here in the first part, these, murm these scribes and Pharisees, they were complaining, they were murmuring, they were upset because the Lord Jesus receives sinners and, and eateth with them. And, and he's trying to get them to understand this thing of rejoicing over that which is lost and now is found. And he goes on to verse number 6. And when he cometh home, when the shepherd comes home, when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, over, uh, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. The wonder of just one. Now, I, don't, I don't truly do not understand this. Did you know when the Lord Jesus came out of the grave, there was rejoicing in heaven at what had been accomplished on the cross and from the, from the resurrection of the tomb, rejoicing. And I understand the rejoicing in heaven today as all of heaven rejoices in God, our, uh, God uh, and, and, his, and who He is. But rejoicing over me? Rejoicing over me? I know some of the folks around the church were glad. No, they were glad when I got saved and they shook my hand. And, and but can you imagine in heaven the wonder? I don't, listen, the wonder, number one, I don't understand the love of God. Why he loves me. Now, I, I didn't understand why he loved me to start with. I don't understand why he loves me today. I don't understand the love. I don't understand why he went through all he went through for me. Down in verse number 10, it talks about there's, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons which need more. You know what? I have, been, I have been carried where an angel has never been carried on the shoulders of the Son of God. I, the, the Son of God did for me what He has never done for an angel. And in the presence of the angel, there is rejoicing. And they desire to look into what's going on, and they don't understand it. Why the blessed Son of God would be, even today, bearing in His body the marks in heaven at, because of what happened on the cross at Calvary. They don't understand. The, the, and I don't understand it either. That's why the Bible says, For God so loved the world for just one. So we got to reach the world. There's a bunch of people out there. But if we could just do one and one and one. Um, my daughter-in-law, our son, our son is started a church and pastors that church in Quebec, Canada. They were missionaries in Ivory Coast until the Civil War. And uh, started a church. It's called Église Baptiste de la Foi de la Mauricie, and, uh, which is, means the, the, um, the Faith Baptist Church of the Mauricie. Mauricie is the, ridge, the region of Quebec where they are. Our daughter-in-law went online, went on to Google Maps, and she was looking online just to make sure everything was posted. If anybody wanted to pull it up, they, you know, if they ever topped in uh, Église Baptiste de la Foi in Google Maps, it would come up. And so she went online just to see if it was there and everything was good. And she went to the street view to see what, you know, the Google car comes around and look at the street view. And uh, she noticed that the picture, if you pull up the street view, it hits the side of the church, and she saw two of our grandsons. There's three up there. She saw two of our grandsons. And she noticed at the telephone pole in front of the church, there was a little blonde-headed kid sitting there at the telephone pole. And so with Google, you know, if you've worked, done the street view, you can move the, you know, the street view along, and, and it'll kind of move you up the street. And as she moved up the street... Here's the picture of a little boy sitting at the telephone pole. Now, th our two grandsons, um, what they're doing is they're putting some stuff. My son, they live in the church. And they, uh, they, were, they had bought a $5,000 camper. And uh, so our two grands grandsons were around there on the side of the, of the church. putting some. They go 15 minutes away in this camper just to get away, you know, into a little, to a, some little places around there. Everybody has a swimming pool. I don't understand. Everybody in there have an have a above-ground pool and a camper in Quebec. Everybody, just about. Except he doesn't have the pool yet. But anyway, um, he, so they're putting stuff in there. So when Amanda looked at that, she called Jason, our son. She said, look at this. And they pulled it up, and there was a little boy that thought this was just a church, and he saw the boys out there, and he had been standing out there waiting on a bus, and he had came and knocked, came and knocked on the door wanting some water. And Jason, when he gave him the water, he gave this little boy, probably 10, 12 years old, he gave this little boy a gospel track. Well, the little boy leaves. They don't know where he went. And they, they keep working on the trailer, Jason said. 
And when Amanda pulled it up and screen, scrolled over, here's this little boy sitting at the telephone pole reading the gospel track. You know what that is? That's just one. Now, we don't know what happened to this little boy. Jason didn't even know that Google, the Google, uh, Google car captured this little boy. But you know what? Heaven captured it. Just one. When Jason started the church, the folks up there, they don't really know much about church. And Jason started having folks come. And, and um, there's a little girl, her name's Kellyanne. She's, they, her mom and dad started coming to church. They'd gotten saved. And Kellyanne was two, I guess a year and a half when they started coming to church, when Jason first started the church. And they didn't know how to act in church. They didn't know how to make the child behave in church. And this little kid would walk around all over the place. Kellyanne walk around. She had, she had beat on the piano. So Jason, while he was preaching, he could have said, hey, you come here. But he went over there. He picked Kellyanne up and he'd carry her, he carried her around while he was preaching. You know, he, because he loved that family. He wanted that family in church. And so he, he carried her around, and, and so they, the next one, Sydney, came along, and now they got a little boy, Chad. And um, this last fall, Kellyanne's mom, Isabel, called Jason and said, Kellyanne's asking questions about salvation. Now, she's been in church now nine, for eight years now, and, uh, or seven years. And so she's asking her mom. She said, Mom, I want to get saved. I don't want to go to hell. So she calls Jason up. She said, Can I bring Kellyanne over to the church? And so Jason got to lead Kellyanne, the one he had been carrying around when she was a little bitty girl. She used to call him Pastor Jesus. That's what she called him, Pastor Jesus. <laughs> and so um, in February, she, had a, she goes to an English school. Her mom loves English. They're French-Canadian, she, so she sends her, her children to an English school so they can, you know, they, they speak English, and Kellyanne speaks perfect English and French. And so they had a... In their class uh, in school, she had to write a short paragraph about an important person in your life. And so she brought it home. She had a few misspelled words. She, she got 90 on, on, the, on the little assignment because she had a few misspelled words. But here's what she wrote. She said, the most important person in my life is a person who Christians believe in. His name is God. As Christians, we believe that he created the whole world, including us. We also believe that he is the king of kings. To communicate, we do something called praying. To tell some of his stories, he sent us a book called the Bible. To all Christians, he is the most important person in our lives. We love our God. Can you tell what that is? That's just one. That's just one. Let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Pastor, would you come? pastor comes, they come with a song, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Two questions. First of all, do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? You're one that he died for. You're one that he loves. You're one that he wants to save. And all you have to do is come and there'll be someone here to take the Bible and show you what you need to do. You won't be confessing, confessing your sins to a preacher or to anybody in the church, but you'll turn through the word of God and see that all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved, trusting in him as you come and repent. Repent simply means turning from your sin, turning to God, believing and trusting in him. Then second question, are you, are you concerned about just one? Are you concerned about your family, about your neighbors that you work with? Are you concerned? If not, we would ask you to come today and help us all to have a burden and passion for just one. Father, I pray your will be done in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as pastor comes.